Golang is an easy yet flexible but powerful programming language to learn. And many large companies such as Netflix or Uber are actually depending on this programming language. Additionally, popular tools such as Kubernetes or Docker are actually based on Golang. And honestly, the mascot is kind of cute, so that's another reason to learn it. That's why I've decided that you will learn this programming language within a few minutes in this video. So let's go. Installing and setting up Golang is pretty straightforward and everything is well documented on their website. So hopefully you will not struggle with the installation. First off, we obviously need to create a new project. And we do this in a new directory. So I'm currently in an empty directory. And what we need to do now is basically initialize a new module in Golang. For that, we just say go mod in it, and then we define the module name. Now the module name can be everything you want pretty much. However, Golang recommends to use an URL. So for that, we can basically say github.com if you have a personal website, you can also use this. But this module name is really important for further importing your dependency if you want to serve this specific project as a dependency for other developers. Now I'm just going to use github.com slash then my github username and then we define an arbitrary project name. After that, we can actually see a go.mod file. Now if you go into this go.mod file, we can actually see our module name and the Golang version. Now the go.mod file basically describes all the dependencies we use throughout this specific project. And now we can start by creating our main file, like in all other programming languages as well. Now these seven lines here are pretty basic, but these are just required for just building and testing if everything works fine. Let's just build our project. We can simply do this by running go build and go build actually creates an executable file. And you can obviously run this executable file on your operating system. But obviously it's pretty bad to go build and then run the executable. So we can just say go run main.go and then we can see our hello world. And that's how you can build and also run your Golang project. Now let's quickly look at these seven lines here. The first line is actually package main. Now this is required to define our main package or our main file for the Golang programming language. Now we're not going to look specifically at packages in this tutorial. However, I highly recommend just looking up for the documentation about that. After that, we're going to import FMT, which basically imports formatted IO operations. For instance, a function in that would be print line, which just prints something to the console. On line five, we're going to declare the main function. This is necessary to say go, hey, our project or our program actually starts here. After that, we're going to print something to the console, like I said before. Now it's important to note that we say print line with a capitalized P. Now this signals Golang that this function is actually public. So not private, not protected, it is public. I'm going to go into more depth what is private and what is public later on. So let's quickly talk about variables here. Obviously we can declare variables and the first way would be to just use this syntax here. Now in this line we declare a variable x with the data type int which has the value 10. And we obviously can reassign this variable to for instance 20 later in our program. Now Golang consists of all possible data types you can think of. However, writing this specific syntax in Golang is a lot. And that's why there's a shorter way of doing things. And we can do this by simply doing this line here. Now this is the shorter way of declaring but also initializing a variable. And this is basically the assignment operator. Now with that shorter way of declaring variables and initializing them, Golang automatically detects the type for this variable here. Next to these variables, we can obviously use all possible mathematical operations. Now I think conditions are pretty easy to understand. We obviously have our simple if condition and we also have our else if condition and obviously we also have our else condition here. Now I don't think that I need to explain anything else. This should be pretty straightforward. Now let's quickly talk about the two most fundamental data structures in Golang. The first one is arrays 
And the next one is slices. Arrays are basically fixed arrays, so they have a fixed size and therefore we cannot append a new element. To declare an array, we can simply use this here. Now this obviously declares just an array, but not initializes them. Obviously we can set specific elements to specific values. However, there's also a shorter way of declaring and initializing an array. We can just use the syntax we had before. So basically we use here the assignment operator. And then we have curly braces, and in these curly braces, we define the elements. Now this here just works fine. The only issue is here that we obviously cannot append new elements, so we cannot change the size. And that's why slices exist. Now to declare a slice, we can simply remove the 5 here. And this is now a dynamic array, so we can basically delete elements, but also append elements. For pending elements, we can simply say x is equal to append, and then we use the array again, and then the new element. Now it's important to note that append does not mutate the original array. Now obviously maps are also a thing in Golang, and they can actually contain key value pairs. Now to create an empty map, we can simply make use of the make keyword. So just FYI, you could also use the make keyword, for instance, for building an empty slice or array. So if we use the make function here and then declare our map data structure, we have first of the first type in square brackets, which defines the type of the key. In this case, we could use string and the values in our map should be integers. So with that specific line, we've now declared an empty map, which contains strings as keys and ints as values. Now to simply assign a key value pair to this map, we could just use a, then we define the key here in square brackets, and then we assign the value 10 for instance. Now this obviously inserts a new key value pair into our map. To delete key value pairs out of this map, we can simply use the delete function. Now the first argument of this function is the map and then we simply define the key here. So let's quickly talk about loops. In Golang, we only have one single loop. However, we can use this specific loop to basically have our while loop, do while, endless loop and simple for loop. To use this loop, we can simply say for, then we have our i for instance, we assign the value 0 directly here, after that we have our condition, and then we increment or decrement this specific variable. Now this is a pretty basic for loop we use in all our other programming languages. But we can make out of this for loop a while loop as well. For that, we just remove the initialization here. We also remove the increment, move the increment into the body of our for loop. And outside the for loop, we just define our i. Now this can be the longer way of writing variables, but we can also use the shorter way here. So this is now our simple while loop. To have an endless running loop, we can simply remove the i and that's basically it. Now we have an endless running loop. Now obviously Golang also contains the popular continue and break keywords to just interrupt the flow of our for loops for instance. Now let's quickly talk about functions. So we've already declared our main function and we've already used functions here. But let's just declare another function which we call add. Now we define parameters in Golang for functions by just specifying the name first and then defining the data type. And for the return type, we also just define the type after the normal brackets. And then in this function, we're just going to return a plus b. Now that's pretty straightforward. But there's obviously also another shorter way of defining the parameters of this function here. Because a and b are the same types, we can just get rid of the first type declaration here of a. And now Golang knows that a is also an int. The reason for that is that the data type int is being automatically applied to our function parameter a. The funny thing about Go is that we can write applications and programs without even caring about any errors in our project or in our application. Now obviously applications can terminate due to whatever error comes up, however we can just ignore them in our application code here. But you will most likely see in all standard libraries and all other libraries multiple return types for a function. And it is a pretty common thing that for instance a function returns a value and a possible error. 
Now I'm going to quickly show you what that means. Now if we're going to quickly define this SQRT function here, obviously this can return a float64 but also an error. Now this function returns now a tuple which is of type float64 and an error. So we have two values that we can return here. Obviously we cannot take the square root of a number below zero, theoretically. So we can just make this check and then we can return for instance zero and we use the fmt function error f. Now this function defines or returns an error and in here we can say a cannot be less than zero. And obviously after that we are just going to calculate the simple square root of a using the built-in math standard library. Then we use square root of a and then we return nil. Now nil basically means null or undefined like in other programming languages. Now obviously we can make use of this function, so let's quickly do that. Because square root now returns a tuple, we can actually say a and then a possible error and then we assign it directly to the return value of the square root function. So for instance, if we do that, obviously it will error out and a would be zero. And we can do this by checking if error is not equal to nil, then we just want to return or panic our application. Now panicking in this case basically means terminating our application and throwing this error here. And this will automatically return. So if error is nil, so there is no error, we can make use of A by, for instance, printing it. Now Golang is generally not an object-oriented programming language, but Golang still gives us some similar concepts like structs or interfaces. So the first one is structs, and structs are basically a collection of different types. To define a struct, we can simply say type, then we define the struct name, and then we use the struct keyword in here. And then in here we can obviously define our different variables, such as name or for instance the age. Now it's important to note that name and age is lowercase, and there is a specific reason why we are doing this here. Obviously person can be also lowercase. And like I said before, everything that basically starts with a capitalized letter is public, and everything that starts with a lowercase letter is private. Now we can initialize structs by basically using the assignment operator again. And then we say person and in here we can say name and define the age as well. And like in other programming languages as well, we can just access the age or name by using the dot operator. So we can say p.age returns null and p.name then returns Florian in this case. Now interfaces in Golang and in other languages as well define behaviors. To define an interface we can simply use the type keyword as well, then we define the interface name and then we use the interface keyword. And in here we do not implement any logic but we just define the functions or the behavior of our structs. So for instance, we can just make use of the string function here, which basically returns a simple string. Now let's quickly define a function called print stringer. And the argument of this function is just of type stringer. And now we can make use of this string function. So for instance, we can just print the return value of this string function here. Now you might ask yourself, how do we actually implement now the string function, for instance, for our person struct? We can do this by using this syntax here. Now what does this syntax mean? First off, we define that this function is only accessible in our struct. And we do that by basically using this syntax here, by defining the person and by saying, hey, this function is now defined in our struct and not bound to the main.go file. And now we can make use of the print stringer function and we just say p in this case. Now go automatically detects based on the function definition in our interface which specific struct implements this interface. And because we use this specific function declaration in our interface for our person struct, Go knows that this struct implements our interface. Now the last thing I want to talk about are pointers. Pointers are an essential thing in a lot of low level programming languages. However, to sum up the concept behind a pointer is that a pointer only points to some memory. That's, that's it. So for instance, if we now declare a variable here, we can get the memory address by just using the ampersand 
and then the variable name. B now points to the memory address of X. Now it's important to note that we can also dereference this B. So if we want to get the value of the memory address that points to the variable X, we can just say asterisk and then B. Now this is just a dereference of B and therefore C is zero. Now in Go you will actually see pointers a lot. Now let's just imagine that we have a set name function in our person struct. Now this works and it compiles without errors. However, it does not change the value in your person struct. The reason for that is that P is pretty much a copy of our person struct and does not reflect the memory address of our person struct. So basically, if we now say set name in the main function here, this P does not really reference the variable that we use in the line above. It actually just kind of copies it and in set name, it just manipulates or mutates the name variable of this copied struct. Now to fix this behavior, we can simply use a pointer. Now in here, Go actually knows that it should basically pass in the memory address of this person struct. And then through mutating variables in this function, we mutate the original struct and not some kind of copy. And that was a brief overview of the Golang programming language. Thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye bye.